I'm happy to have with me here somebody that uh, we've been familiar with if you're a WCW fan, but he's back in the mix now with ad-free shows doing uh, a program called Time Limit Draw, which we'll be t- touching about heavily on this episode. I have Lash Lure with me. Lash, thanks for doing this, man. Dominic, thank you for having me, man. It is a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> thanks, man. So, yeah, let's uh, – I before we even get into the Time Limit Draw, I want to just – get into the delve into how did you get into the art aspect and drawing in general overall was that something that happened first before wrestling was a passion of yours or how just give me the background on that the wonderful thing for me and it's just a tremendous blessing is it's gone hand in hand for me uh strangely enough but here's my journey and it's a great story i think and i, I just love how it played out and it shows that god's infinitely wiser than we are that he kind of makes these things happen and orchestrates them in a way that just works perfectly. When I graduated high school, uh, I wanted to just be as successful as I could possibly be, right? I came from a very poor, modest background, very impoverished. And I thought, okay, being a naive young man, two things that were guaranteed success in my mind was I could either be a doctor or a lawyer, which is it going to be? So (laughs) I went to college uh, wanting to study pre-med and follow that course and try to be a doctor. And I've always enjoyed drawing, loved drawing from the time I was a kid. In fact, someone I admired greatly was interviewed once and said, how much of art do you think is taught and how much of it is just a God-given talent? And his answer was phenomenal. He said, look, I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is I've never seen a kid that doesn't draw. Just some keep drawing and some stop. And for me, I just kept drawing. And so I always enjoyed that while my friends, when I was young, would draw Batman and Superman from comic books, and they were so into that, and a lot of people still are. I wasn't as impressed. I mean, I love the artwork and I love the colors, but I thought, okay, if I draw Batman, it's a square head with very few details. <laughs> yeah. What about right? What was really cool to me and just jumped out off the page to me, and I guess also because of my humor and what I enjoy about life was Mad Magazine. And I don't know if you're familiar with Mad Magazine. Oh, I am. Yeah, I was gonna actually bring that up. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Heavily influenced by Mad Magazine. And the reason why it jumped off the page at me and just drew me right in was because what it's one thing for you to have a comic strip that's funny. It's another thing for you to have a comic book that tells a great story. But for you to combine telling a great story and humor with, we're making fun of a movie or a television show. Well, now it better look like that celebrity, instantly recognizable. So when you're making fun of Top Gun, and I can open the page and I said, that's Tom Cruise. It may be a cartoon, but I can tell that's Tom Cruise without reading anything. That just blew my mind. So fast forward, I started into college and I began taking these pre-med courses and they were long and they were dry and they were difficult. And I had to take some electives anyway. And I took one figure study class as sort of an offset to recharge my batteries after taking these long chemistry labs. And In that semester, I remembered how much I loved drawing and enjoyed it. And I've always been sort of an autodidact, meaning that if I took an interest in something, I try to teach myself as much as I possibly can. So I started researching and reading. And what I really loved was illustration and cartoons. And I realized you didn't need a degree to be a cartoonist. They just had to like your work and buy it for magazines and things at the time, right, for publishing. So I took a semester off college, began drawing cartoons and submitting them to magazines. And at that exact same time, my life had slowed down enough to start watching wrestling again. And this is right when the NWO hit. We're talking about 96. You know, the power plant began promoing on Nitro uh, that they were offering free tryouts. And I thought to myself, you know what? I keep myself in decent shape. I wrestled in high school. I played football in high school. I won a state championship in both. Uh, I don't know that I would ever make it in wrestling. But how cool would it be just to go to a tryout and maybe I meet Ric Flair in person or Sting or Hulk Hogan, and I've got a cool story to tell my friends, right? So I went to an open trial on a whim at the exact same time that I'm trying to sell my cartoons. And wrestling just happened to come natural to me. I mean, how I made it through that trial is a whole different story, but I got to the other end of it, began my training, and realized that there might be something to that. And about the time that I got accepted into the power plant, I sold my first cartoon to the Saturday Evening Post and to Cat Fancy. And so it's funny because I always look back and I go, well, if I had sold the cartoons first, would I have pursued that and not even tried wrestling? Uh, But I was all in for wrestling at that point. And I began doing that, began doing my training. And when I started doing Monday Nitros and and Thursday Thunders and things like that, 
anyone that's been behind the scenes in that business knows that if you have a show that starts live at 7 p.m. on television, well, you better be at the building at noon because we have to make sure you're in a different town every night. Let's be sure they haven't lost your luggage and your gear. If you've got pre-tapes, we need to hit those. If we're going to do local media, you have the interviews. But if you don't have any of those things, you've got a lot of downtime. And I began taking a dry erase marker with me, and I'd go to the whiteboards in the locker room, and I would draw caricatures of the guys. And uh, Kurt, Kurt Henning loved that. Being the, the natural, practical joker and river that he was, he thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And he would just sit in the locker room and go, last, last, draw Hulk Hogan. I'm like 21 years old. I'm going, oh, okay, so I'll draw Hogan. Draw him really old. Okay, I draw him really old. Draw him with a walker and an oxygen mask. And I'm going, dude, he's in the other room. And, and Kurt told me then just laugh. He would laugh and he'd go, look, if, if, if anybody complains, you tell them you don't write the news, you just report it. So I still use that even to this day. Yeah. So I was doing cartoons in the back and Ross Foreman from WCW Magazine at the time and Bill Apter at the same time saw that and saw something in it. And they asked me about doing cartoons for the magazines. And I went with WCW Magazine just because I'm a loyalist at heart. And that was my company, you know. And uh, after WCW was bought out, I carried that on and doing that lashing out cartoon and that feature uh, in PWI and in The Wrestler. So all in all, I probably did wrestling related cartoons that had sort of a mad magazine flair to them. That lashing out feature maybe lasted 10, 15 years or so. That's awesome. And like, it's so cool that like, I immediately, when I looked at your artwork, I was like, this is really Mad Magazine-esque. Like, I, and I got so excited, like as a kid, we, I would, me and my brother would just go to the grocery stores and like buy the Mad Magazines and like just be enthralled by all the diverse kind of artwork that they had in there too. And Absolutely. Like, and man, I've got stacks and stacks even now from my childhood of the things I kept was Mad Magazines and Wrestling Magazines. And those are the two things. I don't have a lot of comic books. I have maybe a handful of of comic books that had specific art that was cutting edge at the time, like Spawn when it first came out or something. And I wasn't really that invested in the characters. It was just that the art jumped out at me and I was influenced by that. I wanted to grab it. But I've got mostly Mad Magazine and Wrestling Magazines, man. And I love doing it. And the beautiful thing for me, Dominic, was I had this wonderful position that I'm in now, right? Was I wasn't expected to be a professional artist. You know, they're looking at me going, this is an, a wrestler who happens to be able to draw. So there's a lot of forgiveness there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I had this uh, I, I had this little evolution where I was given a lot of leeway to get better and better and better over the course of years because the expectations were lower than they would have been for someone that was expected to be a professional illustrator. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And like to have that ability to kind of and we talked about this off air when I first talked to you was like having that outside element of wrestling is, I think, so key with a lot of people like and it's like you got to find another passion beside because you don't want to invest your whole life that defines you as a wrestler, like a wrestler defines who you are. You want to be, you know, somebody more than that. And I think, you know, that you were able to find those two almost basically at the same time in a lot of ways. It's pretty damn awesome. Well, I appreciate that, man. And if you don't do that, I think what, what you wind up running the risk of, Dominic, is you you have pigeonholed yourself into such an identity mm -hmm. that if you don't have wrestling anymore, and we know how uh, flippant that business can be and how fickle it can be, and you can find yourself on the outs and find yourself out of a job, and you go from making, say you're, you're even a mid-card guy, and you're just making a couple of hundred grand a year, 250 grand a year, and you're doing pretty well for yourself, and and making a name for yourself and people recognize you and want your autograph, but then you're off TV for, for six months and nobody recognizes you anymore and you're not making that income. How does that translate over into the real world for you to go out and get a different job? And so that, I think that leads to a lot of the depression and a lot of the devaluation of self where you went from having this high earning income and, and something you're extremely proud of that you provided for your family and everything else. And now it's gone. What do you do? Right. Right. Yeah. And you have to find something else that makes you who you are when ultimately you have that stuff inside of you already, but you just don't know what it is. You know, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What um, as far as uh, artwork that you've done so far, what is some what is something that an accomplishment or, or a project that you've been most proud of so far? Well, I think mentioning uh, 
still that cartoon of Saturday Evening Post. You know, to me, that's for a cartoonist, that was like the pinnacle of wrestling at WrestleMania in Madison Square Garden, you know, because you're talking about the magazine that Norman Rockwell painted the covers for, you know. Yeah. And that was so huge and so big to me, and it just blew my mind, man. And it was wonderful and sustainable. And then there's other opportunities where I'm one of those kind of people. I try not to rest on my laurels. So I very often will not celebrate the wins when they happen. And then hindsight 2020, I'll look back over the years and I'll go, wow, like, I'll be honest. One of the things that blows my mind, I go in my closet and I've done a lot of design work. And suddenly I'll realize I have maybe 24, 30 different T-shirts for just different companies are, you know, in ministry where I do youth ministry and I'll do theme T-shirts for my youth and things of that nature and my student ministries. And I'll have 30 different designs that I created myself. You know, an example of that, a lot of people wouldn't know this and fans may be interested. When we did the Misfits in Action gimmick in WCW, I created that logo, that MIA logo that they put on T-shirts and that we wore on our tights. I created that. Oh, wow. Here's some real inside baseball. Chavo Guerrero, if you look at his tights even now, he has sort of a tribal design on the side. Mm -hmm. If you very closely, that tribal design on the side that he's worn on his tights for years was the background tribal design that sort of was behind the seal that I made that said MIA. Really? So looked, yeah, they came out the size. I just took the MIA part off when Chavo was looking for a design post MIA and just gave him that tribal design that I had used underneath it. How about you? So it still carries on. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I've done a few t-shirt designs for Chavo since then, as a matter of fact. That's great. Oh, man. Yeah. What's, um, okay, let's talk about Time on the Draw a little bit. And uh, how how did that all can't come to be? And um, from a perspective of, it's almost like you're dipping your toe back in wrestling in a, in a little bit of a way, too. It is. It is. And to be Dominic, Dominic, to be honest about it, that was one of the things that sort of uh, made me hesitant. Uh, Conrad approached me. I would imagine it's been a couple of years ago, man. At least it's been a couple of years ago because this would have been pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what he had in mind, but he did say, he said, we're starting this ad-free thing. And I didn't even know what that was going to look like at the time. And he goes, I think there might be a place for maybe you in some way bringing back your old lashing out wrestling cartoons what do you think about that and I kind of him and hawed you know and I appreciated so much the opportunity man but I went you know I've been away from the wrestling business for about you know 10 years at that point and I said uh you know to me it just feels like I'm dipping my toe back in and I'm one of those kind of guys I don't like to be half in or half out or anything I'm either in the business or I'm not in the business type of mentality and I was just very intimidated by the prospect of entering back into the wrestling world, for lack of a better way of putting it, and wondering what that would look like with fan interaction and having been gone so long, you know, and, and how they may or may not remember me. And uh, then it just kind of got put on the back burner. He respected that. He was very, very cordial and very nice about it, very kind about it, and he respected that. And then I had another podcaster uh, contact me, uh, someone that – is pretty well known on social media. I, I don't know how many people may have followed this or not. I don't know if I should mention it. Well, I'll mention it. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Super. He, he does this uh, Twitter handle, Super 70 Sports. That's just, oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. but, so I got to know him uh, really well. Ricky Cobb got to know Ricky really, really well. Did some stuff for him, did some logos for him. And we talked about me doing some artwork for him. And he was looking to start a podcast. And it never really kind of took off. And during that same time, maybe about six or eight months after that looked like it was not going to happen, uh, Ad Free Show sort of contacted me again. And I said, you know what? The timing feels right. This feels good. Uh, I was in a different place and a different level with my artwork. My business had exploded doing caricatures on the side. And it just seemed like the perfect marriage and good timing. And let's be honest, anybody that's been around the wrestling business or observed it for any particular uh, you know, amount of time, you've realized pretty quickly that timing is so important in the, in the business. Right. Very much so. Very much so is um, so yeah, again, and let's explain to how the concept is. So you, you sit there for about uh, an hour, is it? And then you draw, you have a project, there's a theme. And so far you've done Bruce Pritchard, you've done the late Scott Hall and you've done the undertaker just last That's night, correct. as a matter of fact. And then yeah. um, you just interact with the fans and, and Q&A little thing. 
Explain a little bit. That's exactly right, man. The, so the format of the show is this. Uh, the, a lot of the younger fans, will, this idea will probably be foreign to them. But back in the day, you know, when Ric Flair first started his run as heavyweight champion of the world, you had these things that would happen, the 60-minute time limit draw matches, you know, where you're going to wrestle to a 60-minute draw. And the idea behind that is you're either going to have a winner within 60 minutes or if you get the end to that time and nobody has won, then you've wrestled to a draw because it's the time limit. It's up, right? And so they came to me with this concept and this idea, well, what if we do an hour-long show, 60 minutes, and you draw for 60 minutes, and either you'll finish that drawing in 60 minutes or not, with the idea being I tried to complete the drawing in 60 minutes. Now, what it really turns into is I end up talking more than I probably should rather than drawing. Yeah. And, but I draw, and, and fans, by the end of the show, get a great idea of exactly what that finished product's going to look like. The, with the magic of television, though, I can go back and kind of juice it up a little bit. By the next day, I'll turn around and have that thing print ready. And the fans that have participated and watched now have an opportunity to purchase that print. And we'll send that print to them individually signed, individually numbered. It's a one of a kind, uh, almost a, we, we've coined the phrase, it's the NFT of caricature, right? It's a non-fungible token <laughs> because I have kind of numbered each one, but I can still just email it to you. You can send it to, upload it to one of those photo labs that you might in a box store that you might send your photos to, get 11 by 14 printed for you. It's ready for you, right? Just like that. And whatever the subject is, I'll be asked about. We'll tell stories. I'll draw during the process. And the equipment that I use, um, when I do live caricatures, one of the formats of live caricatures that I'll do is I have a television that I set up that's a flat screen TV. I can plug my iPad into that, and I draw digitally directly on my iPad, so that image comes up on the television. So it's like having a newscaster's monitor right beside me. So while I'm speaking to you, you can see the drawing as it's being created. And so I'm talking and drawing at the exact same time. And when it's all said and done, I can pull it up, and we can show a close-up of, of what it looks like I've completed. Oh, man. That's such a cool concept. And, like, you know what? You know, as a kid, like, seeing Bob Ross and stuff during on yes. PBS and everything like that, you're like... Uh, I've actually, yeah, I've used that phrase. I said, you know, I'm part Bob Ross, part Jim Ross. That's what you <laughs> That's, right? yes. That's what you <laughs> That's fantastic. Is there um certain bucket list? I mean, you've probably drawn all the wrestlers, you know, that we can probably imagine, but, like, is there a certain bucket list wrestler or celebrity that you would love to draw, like, kind of on a big platform almost? Uh, you know, that, that's a that's a very good question. One of the interesting ones that got thrown at me last night, and, and this meant more to me than it would probably mean to other people, where someone brought up the Armstrongs. Oh. And I would love to draw the Armstrongs and be able to feature them on a show like that just because they have meant so much to me. You know, I have a personal investment in that. They were so good to me from the early on in my career uh, going on through and Brad and I were extremely close in WCW, you know, wrestlers have their travel companions or travel buddies. Someone that you really click with and that you ride the roads with. And Brad was that guy for me. And he was a mentor for me and every one of those brothers and Bob Armstrong as well, the bullet, just phenomenal people. And I've always wanted to be able to put together uh, something that did justice to their legacy and what they mean to me. And to be honest with you, it's one of those few drawings, I've always been intimidated by. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just really have. Even when I was doing my lashing out cartoons, I would do things that were very cartoony and very Mad Magazine-esque. But if someone that I cared about or admired greatly passed away, then most of the time, not always, but most of the time, I would back off the cartoony aspect of it and do something that was a little more serious looking and more of a tribute type of drawing, uh, almost portrait style. And, uh, you know, just to show a little bit more respect and homage to them. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know where I would balance that out doing the Armstrongs, man, but I would love at some point to be able to recognize all of them. And, of course, now we have an Armstrong that is a member of our ad-free family. So if you didn't know, now you do. Now you do. I know. And the road dog, man, what a personality. Uh, I got, we got an early listen to that uh, episode and man, he's great. The, those two Ryan cats and him together, they got some chemistry going. It's going to be a real fun podcast. And a lot of people don't know this unless you knew him personally, we're in the wrestling business, but and Brian road dog would tell you this as well. Brad 
was every bit as charismatic and funny and quick-witted and great storyteller that Road Dog is. He just could not bring that across on in, in matches and across on television. You know, it, it didn't translate. It didn't make it out of the locker room into the ring. And, and I even asked him one time about that. He just he would tell me, go, you know, Lash, I come from that old school mentality, man. And it was just wrestling was serious. And I don't know how to get in the ring and not just be serious. And, you know, and, and I respected that and appreciated that. But if he had been able to take what people saw in his personality in the back and brought it to the front, I guarantee you even Road Dog would have told you that dude would have been world champion. Because he was just he was that great of a worker and he was that charismatic backstage. Yeah. Everybody Brad. He had a great look too, a great presence. And yeah, to, to your point, the 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 work, the in-ring work was amazing with him. Like absolutely. Really one, really. Of, the, one of the best ever. Now from let's get into the wrestling aspect a little bit. What made you get out of wrestling? Uh, would you say? Was there something in particular, or did you kind of just uh, feel like kind of out of it and you're just tapped out in a lot of ways. Well, you know, you, you, we, we talked about timing being everything in wrestling. Mm-hmm. And um, I had both the privilege and, and, and unfortunate, the, the unfortunateness of coming into wrestling extremely young. Right. So I started when I was about 18 or 19 and I didn't start in the independence, man. I went to that open tryout in WCW and for whatever reason, it was something that I feel I was just kind of born to do, especially at that particular time, because the in-ring work aspect of it and the psychology and learning the business for somebody that didn't know anybody that was in the business, had no background in it, had no family that had been in it, had never even been backstage at a wrestling show until I went to the power plant. For somebody like that, it came incredibly naturally to me. I don't know why, but it just did. And I think that's the reason why I started getting some opportunities pretty quickly at WCW. And I had a good run there, man. And then, of course, you saw the bottom fell out of the business, so to speak, when Vince McMahon bought the company. And and not necessarily because I fought them in any way whatsoever, but just it shrunk it, right? Now you've contracted where you have the opportunities to go and work and go and wrestle. And the way that the cards just played out for me was I was called up. I was told they had 22 guys that they were interested in from WCW. I was one of them. I signed a contract uh, with WWE after they first honored my WCW contract. Then later on, they asked me to take a big pay cut and sign a WWE-style contract, which I did. Then they sent me to Cincinnati and and asked me to go there for a few months just to knock the ring rust off. Actually, a few weeks, about four weeks, four to six weeks. That turned into nine months. I never even had a WWE dark match. All these things and feeling like you're stuck up there and feeling like you're stuck in limbo and you combine that with youth and immaturity and inexperience and not really knowing the wrestling business. Man, I thought I knew the wrestling business. You talk about our ad-free family. I love listening to uh, My World with Jeff Jarrett because you get the the perspective not only from the talent perspective, but you get from the promoter perspective and the business aspects of it, man. And I thought... It never dawned on me until I started listening to his show. I go, nobody ever taught me the business. They taught me how to work. I could have great matches. My psychology was dynamite. I know how to go out there and get myself over. I knew that aspect of it. But from a business standpoint, how you remain relevant, how you keep yourself booked, how do you carry yourself as a wrestler if you're not just under contract with a particular company? How do you promote yourself? How do you sustain yourself? I didn't know any of that stuff. I'm 25 years old, brother. I'm 24 at the time. I, I was clueless and I didn't even know that I was clueless and I didn't know enough to know what I didn't know. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. so, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I couldn't even call somebody. So <laughs> that <laughs> that's where I was. And you combine that with feeling like you're not being given your due when things happen the way they did. And you're stuck up there and in, in developmental territory at WWE and you're not even a developmental talent. You're an in-ring talent. You don't have a developmental contract. And I'll be honest with you, it beat me. It's one of the first times in my life that I was beaten psychologically and beaten emotionally. And it brought me down and I didn't even realize it at the time. And so I floundered, man. I did not make the most of that opportunity. And I blamed everybody but myself, you know. Um, And I was a victim of circumstances. I'm probably being a little hard on myself. But most guys in the wrestling business find themselves at some point in that position. And you can either blame others or you can just work harder. 
And I blamed others instead of working harder. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it now. I didn't think so at the time, but I'll admit it now. And I squandered that opportunity because I felt like uh, I'd taken such a big pay cut. I felt like I'd done everything they'd asked me to do. And I felt like I wasn't even been given an opportunity. And you take those things personally. When hindsight 2020, man, and you look back with some perspective and you go, man, there was nothing personal about that. Nobody's being malicious. Nobody wants to not see Lash LaRue succeed. Nobody's holding me down. <laughs> it was just, uh, look how many guys were under contract with WWE at the time. Look how many guys were transitioning over from WCW looking for a spot. And look how many guys were already in WWE had proven themselves and didn't want to lose their spot. I don't blame anybody, man. But I came off that, and things didn't work out with WWE. I went to Germany, did a couple of tours there, man, did some stuff there, did, did some stuff in Australia, bounced around, did some independence. Um, and at the same time, I was starting to accumulate some injuries for the first time in my life, you know. And along with accumulating those injuries, I was depressed about the business. Didn't even realize I was depressed about the business. I think looking back, I was mourning the demise of WCW and what we had, had there and didn't even know it. Um, not to go off on a tangent or get in the weeds too much, but I read a book later on that made a lot of sense. And it said there are certain vocations in this life, certain jobs that you have that are not really jobs or lifestyles. You take someone that's in special forces. That's not a nine to five, right? That's something you are. That's your identity. Right. You take someone that's a first responder, same thing. Someone that's a doctor. You, you take anyone that has something over the top, like an entertainment, an actor. Well, if you take that away from them, it's like mourning a loss in your family. It's like you've lost a part of yourself, not just that you don't have that job anymore. And again, what, like I said before, how does that translate over into the real world? So all that being said, I found myself at about 30 years old, 31 years old or so. And I didn't even mark the date, man. I just walked into a show. I felt beat up. I was heavier than I should have been. I'd had several, you know, concussions at that point. And I walked in, I was wrestling Bull Buchanan that night at a high school in Pell City, Alabama. And I walked in and saw that I was wrestling Bull in the main event, knew we would have a great match. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, Bull, I'm retiring tonight. He goes, all right, man. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So, no, I really am. I'm retiring tonight. So, all right. He never took me seriously. I saw him years later, as a matter of fact. He goes, where have you been? I go, I told you I was retiring. I it's thought done. you were me. I, no, that's a long rib. But uh, anyway, so we had a great match. I walked out of the ring. I did not cut a promo. I didn't announce it. I didn't make sure that it got out there on the internet. I just walked out, hung my boots up, and have not been in a wrestling ring again since then. How about that? That and I mean, that's kind of cool in a way. I I, I like that, you know. Yeah. If to well, just get out of it and just like not no fanfare, nothing like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always been a let's 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 do things right and let's walk off into the sunset type of guy. Not because I'm never going to say never, but I didn't want to play or toy with the idea. I'm one of those kind of guys that when I make my mind up, I flip a switch. An example of that is this: what has sort of led me to where I am now on this journey, Dominic is. Um, in 2016, I come off all those injuries. Uh, 2016, I turned 40 years old in 2016. I was 316 pounds and had a 46 inch waist. I'd had 34 concussions. I had two compression fractures in my lower back, a ruptured disc. And I, I said to myself, you know, medication that I'm taking to cover that stuff up is not sustainable. Me being this heavy is not sustainable. It's not who I am. Do I want to live the rest of my life like this? And I looked in the mirror and said, no, I don't. I want to get my flexibility back. I want to get my athleticism back. I want to be who I know that I can be deep down inside. And I lost 100 pounds. It took me about a year and a half to do it. I went from 316 to about 211. Then I started hitting the gym again, man. And, and when I hit the gym again, my body just responded because I hadn't been doing any of this stuff for 10 years. Sure. And I got back up from – 211, I'm about 234 now with a 34-inch waist. I'm leaner than I was in WCW, mm. you know? And I just – it was hard work. It's just pure hard work. And it's, it's – I've learned the value of being consistent rather than being just uh, intense, right? I would try to make up for things when I was young with intensity. Now I use consistency. 
And every day I'm doing a little something, you know, and I'm working hard every day, not because I'm trying to make some big comeback and not because I'm trying to kick the doors open, but because I found myself again. My entire life, my perfect balance has been when my spiritual is in line and my physical is in line and my professional is in line. All those things harmonize like a three legged stool. And if I take one of those legs off, then it starts to collapse, whether it's the physical, the spiritual or or the professional. And when I do have all those things hitting on all cylinders, man, things start happening and life is grand. And I'm enjoying it so much right now, this ride. That's great. And no, that's such a great point too, with like those three main focuses of being what, what really holds you up? Because yeah, if any of those things are kind of out of whack, it just kind of, it does throw you off and uh, get you off a track of what you want to be doing. And then you start to self-criticize and it just starts to snowball all like that. All like that. And the other freedom that it gives you is this. And then I'm not, again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm not trying to blow smoke. I'm not trying to overstate myself in any way whatsoever. But the freedom that it gives you is this. You get a lot of people that get bitter in their older age if they've been a former wrestler. And time starts to pass them by or that sort of thing. Well, now I'm 45 years old, right? I'm 45 years old. Bobby Lashley just held the heavyweight title at 45 years old. I'm not. I'm about the same age as AJ Styles, which was considered a generation after me. I just started, uh, you know, or or I'm about the age of a CM Punk. Maybe he may be just a little bit younger than me. You got guys like Edge and Christian, a little bit older than me. Samoa Joe, too. Samoa Joe. Mm -hmm. Samoa Joe, that's exactly right. Or Batista or these guys or whatever. So there's some freedom for me in being able to look in the mirror and be in shape and know that now – nobody's keeping me out of the wrestling business. Nobody's pushing me away. I don't have to be bitter or resentful and going, oh, well, you know, now it's passed me by and I can't wrestle anymore. I don't have to be mad about injuries and say that I've been mistreated by the wrestling business. If I stay away from wrestling now, it's by choice. Right. You know, nobody's forcing me out. Nobody's forcing me in. And there's so much freedom and peace in that. You have that option if you want it. Absolutely. That's what's great about it. How much would you say, how much of a itch do you have to kind of get back in the ring? If you had to weigh at one on a level one to 10. Man, it, it grows every day. I can't, I can't be dishonest about that. That, that itch is now getting up in the eight and nines, but that doesn't mean that I'm looking to pull the trigger at all by no means, but it's, it's fun to watch the wrestling business evolve and change. It's cyclical. It goes in cycles, man. And we're on an upswing. I think, you can just tell that the overall morale and the passion for the business among the wrestlers themselves, not just the fans, I think has ticked back up again. It's not quite what it was in the late nineties, but I feel that same buzz, you know, and you can't help but to watch other products on TV and you can't help but to see that there's other options and look, man, it's cool to see what fans, I mean, what uh, wrestling companies are doing with streaming services now, for instance, right? To me, I look at the business and the landscape of where it's at and what made things work before there was a WWE was the fact that you had these territories that could work with these local television affiliates, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I see now on the landscape and on the horizon, you have kind of that same model in a more modern day setting, which is you could have a territory that works off of a streaming service, you right. know? And, and that's kind of what you get with, with smaller companies like NWA and things like that, you know, and that's cool to see people doing stuff like that impact. It's cool to see people doing stuff like that more than anything else. It's awesome that there's so many options for wrestlers to do whatever they want to do in the wrestling business from a podcast to video, to actually wrestling, to just going out and doing the Indies. Yeah. Like it, or you look at a lot of wrestlers too. They do their own like personal vlogs or Twitch you know, where they play video games and stuff like that and interact with the fans. There's so much, it's, it's a good way because there's so much accessibility for wrestlers to be able to connect with their fans. But you, again, to like a point, you have an option to do that if you want, because certain aspects of wrestling too allow you to create that air of mystery about you if you want it as well. And that, so, that, right. And you know, that's the other thing that I think that uh, again, timing being so important and I didn't even do this on purpose, but uh, I think I have this added advantage, I hope anyway. That's what it seems like from my perspective is for about the last 10 years, I had been off even social media. You know, I was yeah. a ghost of media. People didn't know how to find Lash LaRue if they wanted to find Lash LaRue. And even now, the only thing social media I'm on right now currently is Twitter. And I just started that last October. So, 
Mike, I'm, I've been off television and been out of the wrestling uh, culture long enough to make it nostalgic, kind of harken back to those old WCW days. But I'm young enough that I'm not necessarily private, past my prime either. So I feel like I'm in a sweet spot that I really get to enjoy. You're right. And like I, you, you mentioned all these streaming uh, stuff and how the landscape is different. You look at guys like like uh, another ad free shows member, Jeff Jarrett, where he's been yes. on like uh, such a wild like journey in his career, like right now with GCW and then he's in AAA and he's doing all this other stuff. So it's like, you know, you can still be relevant and you don't have to like it doesn't have to be your whole entire life, too, if you want it to be. It's like there's some neat aspects about it. Hey, and I'll be honest with you. I think that where the wrestling landscape is now is tailor-made for guys like Jeff Jarrett to thrive in. And the reason why is because I think the big disadvantage that guys from my era have is we came in at a time when they just really started the guaranteed contracts. Mm -hmm. so the structure of the business at that time was you worked for one company and you did what that one company told you to do all the time. So all that you really had to do and know from the wrestling business standpoint is how do I answer to this corporate entity? Not how do I promote myself? How do I get myself out there? How do I diversify? How do I develop my own character and things like that? And I think it's to our detriment because you take us out of that corporate entity and that corporate umbrella, we did not know how to thrive, man. And it wasn't our fault. Just nobody ever taught us and we weren't trained that way. Right. You know, now we're having to kind of learn as we go. And I, I think the sad part about that and I've said this before in an interview is I look back with some perspective now. And I think that there is a, unfortunately a lost generation of wrestlers. That was my generation, right? There's always been this beautiful harmony in wrestling where there is a bridge and there's a bridge from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. I had the, this wonderful advantage. You meant, we mentioned Brad Armstrong and all the Armstrongs earlier, right? I grew up with, Armstrongs. The Armstrongs were a big part of Continental and Georgia Championship Wrestling when I was a kid growing up in Alabama. And so I got to watch them, man, and admire them. And, but yet they were still young enough that by the time I was old enough to wrestle them in the business, I'm learning from them. So that generation passes on what they know to my generation. Well, my generation kind of got pushed out of the business before we had an opportunity to pay that back to the ones that were coming after us. So you almost skipped a generation in a lot of ways. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's some exceptions to that rule. But for the most part, I think you had this big crop of wrestlers around about my age that could have been so much more than they were and just weren't given the opportunity. Oh, 100%. They, there wasn't that platform. And, you know, um, yeah, you, and you mentioned it too, the WCW getting sold, it really like, you know, uh, honed in on a select few amount of talent that were available and that had that TV time and that opportunity to kind of grow and develop where as, you know, sure there was ROH and there was TNA and stuff like that. And that, that was some other options, but still it, the, the landscape of it wasn't as vast and stuff for, for, uh, young talent at that point to learn. So that's right. That's right. And what you miss in that is this, you can have an older generation, the generation before me, still share with the generation that's under me and younger than me. But the problem is so oftentimes they get too old to actually work with them and have these great matches, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas that you want that bridge generation in between that is still young enough to have these matches and, and, ha and teach them a lot in the ring physically as you're going through an actual match itself, as well as talking them through it and helping them learn that way. You know, I, what I perceived in the last 10 or 15 years, and not always the case, but I'm just saying in general, is you had an older generation that's teaching verbally a younger generation, but the younger generation is having to wrestle each other. Right. And try to get better and try to apply what they're being told while wrestling each other instead of wrestling people that are not just their level and their peers, but have been around longer and maybe better than them or know some tricks they don't know or can teach them some timing in the ring that they hadn't thought of otherwise. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. And I think from a fan's perspective or a non wrestler's perspective too, like we, I'm speaking for myself and others, like probably don't consider that as much, you know, from, Hey, they're learning from in-ring work from this person or that, you know, it's, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, yeah, you'd be surprised if you're a great wrestler and a great worker and you're perceptive enough to pick up on these things, you'd be surprised how much you learn just by somebody punching you a certain way. You yeah. know, you're in the match and in the moment it dawns on you go, and you go, Oh, I understand why he did that. You know, yeah. you go, okay, I'm going to do that next time. Or, or it just makes sense in a different way. You know, um, I, 
an example I was just sharing with someone a couple of weeks ago. I had this match with Scott Hall in mm -hmm. WCW. And Scott and I had this great match that I loved so much and learned so much from. If you watch it back now, it looks very much like a squash match. But I learned so much in that match about timing and about feeding, things like that, and stuff that he taught me about subtleties. You know, Scott would say this thing all the time where he would go, uh, here we go, uh, it sounds basic, but uh, if you get a reaction from the fans in a match, leave that in. If it doesn't get a reaction, take that out. <laughs> That's simple. It sounds simple, and it is simple, but here's the thing about it is, what he means by that is, no matter how cool you think that move is, no matter how impressive you think it is, if it didn't get a reaction, why are you wasting your time with it? Mm -hmm. At the same time, no matter how simple you think something is, the way you punch, whatever else, if it gets a reaction, if I'm thumping a toothpick in your face, but it gets a reaction, why wouldn't I do that every single time? You know, right. Diamond Dallas Page taught me that. I was being a, just goofy one day at the power plant and Paige would come down and he would work out with us in the ring and let us do some things and uh and we're in the ring and at that time road dog again another callback to him was doing the shimmy shake gimmick when he dropped the knee on people uh the rock was doing the people's elbow boom scotty two hotties doing the worm right and i was just trying to pop Paige, just trying to make him laugh cutting up with him in the ring while we're working out and i said look i've come up with a new gimmick and he goes Oh, yeah, bro. Let's see it, bro. So I go, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to punch the guy. I'm going to jab him three times. And then I'm going to dance like James Brown. And then I'm going to do the splits. And I'm going to pop back up and I'm going to clothesline him. And I'm walking through it while I'm telling him this, right? And he stops and he comes up out of the corner and he goes, bro, bro, do that every match. <laughs> and you know what? He was right. Mm -hmm. you know? I did that, called it the Bourbon Street Blues, and every single match I did, I would move, I'd work that in one way or the other. And again, that Scott Hall match. You watch that Scott Hall match, I'm wrestling Scott Hall. It's not believable that Lash LaRue, main event NWO Scott Hall, is going to hit him with the Bourbon Street Blues. But you know what I did do? I did three jab jabs, did the splits, popped up, he ducks it, and then hits me with something else. Right. You move set in. But you're not expecting that guy to go uh, to put you over. You're not expecting to get one up on him, you know, but you're still showing that off. Fans are still reacting. They're still seeing something unique about you. Yes. And you're right with Scott, too. Like, that's why he was one of my all time favorites. Was He is my all time favorite, was his punches and just the way he handled his presence in the ring, like, spoke so much. And he didn't have to do a whole lot if he didn't want to, but yeah. he could convey it easily. He, he one time just sat in a restaurant and just uh, pontificated for about 30 minutes on punches. Where he just goes, hey, bro, I'm going to sell a punch totally different in the beginning of a match than I would in the heat, than I would in the comeback, or when I would in the finish. It's the exact same punch, but where we are in the match matters. Absolutely right, 100%. The punch is the same. But if you and I are squaring off at the beginning of the match, boom, oh, and now I'll come back. You hit me with the same punch and you're in the middle of your heat, I may bump out of the ring off of it. Right. <laughs> you know, that's the psychology of a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. It all breaks down with that. What's, um, how much of the like modern product have you watched and who kind of stands out to you in regards to like, oh man, this guy or gal is going to be real good coming up here? Well, I'll say this. Uh, I'll preface it all by saying this. I'm just now kind of getting back into the product a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes back to being out of sight, out of mind. Right. And then away from the wrestling business and then feeling so far removed from it before I had these epiphanies that I shared with you earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm starting to enjoy the product a little bit more again. And obviously, I, I don't think anybody can watch what's out there now and not be impressed by guys like MGF. I mean, he's being this old school heel and, and actually is not afraid to get true heat. Right. You know, I've been a few interviews with him where he does this smart thing, right? He does this smart thing where he can he he can weave his con his his, his uh, interviews in a way and construct his his thoughts in such a way where he is complimenting people like a baby face would, but then immediately turns heel and tells you why it's to his benefit or whatever else. Right. right. And it comes to, so he's always a heel. And I think that's important is, is right now because of social media, 
And because of culture in general, and because of whether it's wokeism or political correctness or anything else, people are afraid to be heels. Yes. People are afraid to be heels. And um, uh, we need more of that. We need more of the MJF guys like that that are not afraid to be heels. Bray Wyatt impresses me from a creative standpoint. I mean, this is a guy that cannot just doesn't just go out there and work, but he's constantly pushing the envelope and constantly trying to evolve characters and change things up a lot, you know. That impresses me. Uh, just the work level in AEW impresses me. I like seeing guys that just come out and get over just off of their in-ring work and then add the character as they go. Um, the thing that I would like to see wrestlers lean into a little bit more now is just that believability aspect of it I think is so very important. Mm -hmm. And ability, what that requires is you slowing down and really selling, you know. And one of the things that I perceive, and I could be wrong on this, I certainly could be wrong on this, but it seems like from a psychology standpoint, I think we have now gotten to a new generation of wrestlers that have grown up never knowing what it's like for there to be true kayfabe in the business, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it growing up, and and I'm not sure what your age is. Uh, I think you might be a little bit younger than I am. Thirty six. Well, there you go. Thirty six. Yep. You're about years younger than me. When I was growing up, wrestling was still considered real, and we still treated it like it was real. And I'll be honest with you, to such an extent that I wasn't completely naive and I wasn't completely stupid, but I didn't know how much of what was what, even when I went and tried out the power plant until yeah. after. I Training. I really didn't. I honestly didn't. I had to kind of learn that as I went. And what that added to me was this, because I grew up thinking it was real, felt it was real as a fan from a fan's perspective, then it's easier for me to treat it like it's real when I'm wrestling, mm -hmm. which adds an element of believability to your wrestling because you wrestle as if it's real. You should always perform in the ring as if it's real. If you wouldn't do it in a real fight, why are you doing it in a match if wrestling is real? You know, if wrestling's real, then I'm really chasing that title, and that title really means something. But if wrestling is – if everything's a work and everything's entertainment, and I knew that from the time I was a kid and I grew up just treating it like it's entertainment and treating it like it's a show, then I think it comes across, if you're not careful, as if these titles don't really mean anything to you. You're treating them like they're props. And I'm not saying let's divorce ourselves from reality – but what I am saying is, if you believe from a wrestler's perspective that that's just a prop and it really doesn't matter who the champion is, then the fans aren't going to care who the champion is. Now, why are they buying a ticket? Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, why are they buying the product if it doesn't matter who wins and who loses? Exactly. And I think that's a, an element of it is like making those stakes always mean something where the title, you know, is the top thing that you should be concerned with, you know, is like, and if you're heel, it's like, making money and getting that title is like those top, those top mentality of things or, you know, anything to that aspect where you have to have some sort of stakes going on that you care about and that the fans are going to care about or hate you for. So again, all that true heel is so important by the way, because mm -hmm. if the heel is not there, if there's not a true heel in the company, if there's just the guy that plays a bad guy and then goes on social media and puts the fans over and thanks them for coming. And I, I mean, I'm not knocking anybody from that. I'm just saying in general, if that's the case and that's what we're dealing with, what happens is this. If you don't have true heels, how are you going to have true baby faces? Right. Mm -hmm. Because you just, you, you're calling yourself a heel and you're playing that role, but you're a baby face outside the ring. And nobody really hates you. Or if nobody's not really scared of you, or if nobody's not really intimidated by you, uh, I don't know why they're really pulling for that baby face. Cause, right. Because they don't have any genuine sympathy for that baby face. They give they you a reason, them. yeah, to not hate them. <laughs> right. that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. We, we talked about it last night with The Undertaker. You know, one of the things that struck me about him from the first day he came out on the scene, man, was just those eyes. Those eyes had an element of believability to him. So I don't care what character you put on him, whether you want to call him a dead man, which seems so unbelievable, right, on its surface, that this is a guy that's already dead, whatever. But because of those eyes, because of his – intensity because of his aura every bit of it was 100 percent believable absolutely it did like he made you invested and like over the course of time whether his uh look or music or anything like that changed 
there was something to still tie yourself to the undertaker because like this was who this guy was and he he carried himself like that all the time whether it was the biker or whether it was the dead man or whether it was the reincarnation of the dead man so to speak like and, and by all of those evolutions made perfect sense and he mm-hmm. made sense yes and that's to his longevity that speaks to just what a genius worker he was by the way too because you know how difficult it is to do that I mean, I don't think that the average fan really recognizes that if you're from a wrestler's perspective, imagine this. They've put a gimmick on you. They've strapped the rocket to you. You're the main event guy. You've won the title. Everything's working for you. You're making big money. You already have arrived. Why would you change things up? Right. The hardest things from a psychological standpoint when you're a wrestler is to mix things up when it's working. Mm Mm-hmm. So for you to have the 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 nerve and the boldness and the uh, the belief in yourself that hey I can pull this thing off and it's time to change things up and to feel that feel your way through all that and have all these different evolutions I think Sting did the exact same thing mm-hmm. you know Sting knew when it was time to go okay I need to alter this just slightly and we need to let this thing grow we need to let it evolve because otherwise it gets stale and it gets stagnant but all through it all. It is still the person underneath that that makes it work. Uh, Brian Lee, who has been a great wrestler in his own right and has had a great career, nothing wrong with his career whatsoever, but that Brian Lee would have never been the undertaker that had a 30-year career as the undertaker. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. He could run, and that angle worked, and, hey, man, it's great, but he's, just, he's not the same guy. He's not the same guy. Just like Kane can be Kane and have this Hall of Fame career. But Kane's not going to have a Hall of Fame f- career as the fake Diesel or as Isaac Yankum. Right. For whatever reason, that doesn't translate for him because he doesn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And if he doesn't believe in that character, the fans aren't going to believe it. No. Mm-mm. And you look at guys, too, like uh, like Terry Funk. He reinvented himself over the course of time. Uh, Chris Jericho, who does it a lot of the times when that – gimmick is really hot or that shtick is hot like the making the list and he, he got rid of it and then he went to something different and sometimes it hits and sometimes it doesn't but overall it's going to make that you know you still who you are and that's what you can't be afraid to try you can't be afraid to try and you know I, I think there's some magic in being able to also say i'm going to take elements of things that are unique to me and still not be afraid to evolve you know um i certainly did not have the opportunities and i'm not going to pretend that i was some genius or whatever either to make those kind of leaps and, and to have these evolutions throughout a long career. But I can remember for myself, uh, uh, another example of that would be when they put us in the misfits in action, mm-hmm. the only direction they gave us whatsoever was, okay, now we're going to call you corporal Cajun instead of the raging Cajun because it's military. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to put you all in, in camouflage and we want you all to wear this urban camouflage colors because that's hip. I said, okay, let me just, so I'm straight on this. You don't care how we wear the camouflage or what camouflage we wear as long as we're wearing camouflage, right? So, yeah. Can I still wear my beads? Yeah, you still wear your beads. I can still be, can I still be Cajun? Yeah, you can still be Cajun. Okay, so here's what I did. I went to the uh, Army Surplus store. I got the two different color, uh, you know, camos. I took them to wardrobe, said split them up the middle, and I want you to sew alternate colors to each legs because that fits my character and fits my persona. I still wore my Mardi Gras beads with the camouflage. I took the bucket hat from Desert Storm, cut a hole in the top, pulled my hair through the top, you know, still wore my sunglasses. And so that's why even though on paper we're all sort of the same character, but I look different than Lieutenant Loco looked, Chavo. Yeah. And then Morris looked as the general, you know. We, we all had our own little thing. Yeah. Well, okay. So say if you kind of stuck around and you, you went on a path at the, you're 25 years of age or at that point too, where you go, okay, I'm moving on, but I want to like, kind of, this is who I want to express more of myself. Is there something that you had in mind that you wanted to work on or, or do with that you just never got the opportunity to when you were at that age? Well, I thought about it a lot and th- there's so many different reiterations of, of that character that you could do. And I think you still could do as a matter of fact, to mm-hmm. be fair about it. And it depends on the landscape of culture and the business. What are people responding to? Or is there an oversaturation of serious wrestlers? If there's an oversaturation of serious wrestlers, wrestlers, well, maybe in order to stand out, I want to be a little bit more goofy and I want to be a little bit more flamboyant. 
Well, in that case, maybe I lean into the Mardi Gras aspect of New Orleans and that Cajun culture, and I come out with the real elaborate costumes like they wear at Mardi Gras, and the purple and the gold and the, the glitter and the glitz and everything else, and you almost look like a walking Mardi Gras parade to the <laughs> ring, and everything's goofy and over the top and fun, and you're throwing, you're throwing beads out. Well, if there's an oversaturation of fun and goofy and you need to be a little bit more serious or maybe you're in, a, in an angle with somebody that you've really taken personally and you've got to be serious about that. Well, now maybe I'm just that old school, I'm, I'm rough around the edges and edgy swamp gator catching, you know, Cajun from the bayou that's getting serious with somebody and, and I'm wearing leather that's all distressed and ripped up and everything else, you know, uh, you know. It just depends on where you are with that. And sometimes it's driven by storyline. Sometimes it's driven by character, you know, or you can just be the comic book, uh, the, uh, the wrestling version of that comic book character gambit, you know, just come out with that little bit of Cajun flair where you've worn like the hood with my hair sticking out the top of it. And you could wear the the trench coat and just have a very similar look and, and have the riverboat gambler type persona to it. And there's so many different directions you can take those things. And it takes a lot of self-awareness going, okay, what can I pull off? Can I be goofy and over the top? Can I be the Ayatollah of Shrek Creola? You know, <laughs> or do I need to be just the raging Cajun Lash LaRue? Do I need to be the Swamp Fox Lash LaRue? You know, just anything and everything. And you never take anything off the table. All that is certainly adaptable. Like, and you can, yeah, apply it to, and like it, a lot of it goes with the times too. And what, what the culture is in a lot of ways, because like a flamboyant Cajun, like going out there with the Mardi Gras stuff and presentation, I think would very much work in today's landscape of wrestling because you don't see something that big and something that was like, almost like a mid nineties WAF kind of style of thing, you know, where. Absolutely. I've always thought to myself, imagine a WrestleMania entrance that yeah. looks like a float. Yeah. And you throw out the beads and the whole thing. I mean, you can picture it. That's, that's, as they say in wrestling, that's money. You know, if it's in the right angle and you get, get an opportunity to get that over and you're wrestling the right person at the right time, man, that could be hot. It could be good, you know. Um, and, and some of that stuff can be driven by other elements you put around it. Like anybody that knows the Cajun culture at all, man, you got, you've got that jazzy New Orleans uh, Mardi Gras sound that you could play off of, or You've got there's what they call swamp pop, and swamp pop has a lot of that almost seventies funkadelic sound to it, with a lot of the whammy board going on in the in the you know electric guitar and everything <laughs> else. And then you also got zydeco music. You yeah, know, that has such a unique sound to it and flair to it. And Jerry Reed too. You got yes, Jerry Reed. Jerry yeah. Reed. Well, Amos Moses. That's right. I that's saw called, that too. What you named your dog, right? <laughs> that's my dog, Amos Moses. I love Jerry Reed. I tell you, he's got such a diverse catalog of music. Like, uh, Smell the Flowers is such a, like, sentimental yes. song. But, yes. like, he's got all those fun ones, too, you know? Like, when yeah. you're hot, you're hot and all that stuff. And then the, the theme to the Dukes, uh, uh, the theme to uh, Smokey and the Bandit. Yep, you know? he's got it down. Mm-hmm. You got that, <laughs> he's got those great Cajun songs. He's got Amos Moses. And then he's got uh, Coco Joe. Yep, Coco Joe. That's right. <laughs> that's another good one. Coco yep. Joe. Okay, so it's so amazing that you brought up Gambit because he's no joke. He's my favorite superhero. So I, I have to ask you also. Here, I'll just show you here too. I got a great story for you then. Okay, that. so maybe maybe it ties to this, but yeah, I got his figure. I like he's he was the kid when I was a kid. Like he got me hooked into superheroes as Gambit. So obviously, late '90s. That's when the X Men movies started coming out, and there was buzz among wrestling fans that like, hey, Lash Larue would make the perfect gambit has anybody talked to you about that like from a from maybe the film standpoint but also just from a wrestler like colleague standpoint i will, I will tell you how far that went okay I'll tell you how far that went and it totally blindsided me i didn't see this coming and I, I took it as a huge compliment and it's one of those missed opportunities you feel in life and it's because um i had somebody email me out of the blue and keep in mind too late 90s man we did not have the social media we have now and you didn't have just this mob mentality of everybody could get behind something and push it. And you also, for the most part, you had more than anything else, just kind of tribute websites. A lot of times that would pop up here and there. Nobody really knew how to best utilize, you know, uh, the internet for promotional purposes. And especially there wasn't this computer literacy that there is now when it came to the internet. Right. So out of the blue, this guy emails me and he goes, uh, 
He goes, Lash, they just did the X-Men movie. He's basically saying what you just said, Dominic, too. He's going, he's going look, Gambit is my favorite X-Men character of all time. He said, the rumor is he's going to be in the new X-Men movie. He goes, I think that you should play Gambit. He's like, he's presenting the case to me. Like, I've got to be sold on it. He yeah. goes, look, you've kind of, you've got the hair already. If they put the, the hood on you and your hair is sticking out of the top of it, right? You got the hood already. So you don't really have to fake the Cajun accent. You got kind of the Cajun accent better than some Hollywood guy that could come and try to learn it. You know the culture. He goes, you're already in shape. You're about the size of Gambit. We just, and you've got kind of the jawline, the whole deal. We think you could pull it off, man. And uh, he goes, I would like to start sort of a campaign lash for Gambit. And he was basically seeking my endorsement of it. <laughs> and my mentality was, I go, knock yourself out. I mean, it's just, it's more promotional stuff for me. What was it going to hurt me? Right. It only helps me. Right. I, sure, man, whatever you want to do, do it. He goes, okay. He goes, I'm going to send you a link in a couple of days. I don't think anything of it. A couple of days later, he sends me a link and I go to his website and this guy, and I wish I knew this guy now. I wish I could remember his name. I wish that I had that correspondence because it was so impressive and so flattering. He had that same argument that he had just laid out to me. He had put in the form of a very professional letter. He had put it up there as, a, as an open letter to fans on the website when they first signed on. And then he also offered it up and he said, okay, guys, look, the last should be Gambit. This is the last for Gambit campaign. Here are, here's, here's who you need to send letters to for a letter writing campaign to Marvel Comics, to whatever the production company was that was doing the movies at the time, to the director, to the producers. He had all these people's contact information. What? He had listed it on the website. And he goes, and if you're not comfortable writing a professional letter yourself, here's a sample letter. Feel free to use this sample letter and put your name to it. We <laughs> can get behind this to start a letter writing campaign. And I was going, oh, my gosh, this is a and, – and for a moment there, for a fleeting moment, I thought, this thing may have legs. And I sort of took it to WCW, and then I tried to sort of take it to WWE. And the problem was it was right in the middle of the buyout. Mm -hmm. right in the middle of the buyout. So nobody in WCW was interested in entertaining the idea and nobody in WWE was interested in entertaining the idea because nobody really knew what either company was going to look like in the next six months, right? And I was such a low man on the totem pole and I certainly did not know uh, enough about the business. It was not sophisticated enough to know how I could leverage that to my advantage. But man, I, yeah, I certainly wish that would have happened. You know, my God, you would have been perfect, man. Hey, I think you still could pull it off, too, honestly. Oh, so, maybe so. I'd love to try. You know what? They have uh, th there was rumors and reports going on that uh, Disney Plus were going to do a Western kind of series based on Gambit. And so, yeah. hey, still might have the shot. Hey, I would love to do it, man. They can give me a call anytime. I'd, I'd do that for true. <laughs> well, I'll get the hashtag Lash for Gambit going. We'll kick it there up. There we go. Time. Let's do it. We'll kick it up. I got some graphic design. Talent, I can use that too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Sweet. Last. Okay. So it's once a month uh, time limit draw, correct? Is that how it is? That's correct. That's correct. And so, um, who, okay, you got the Armstrongs. What's uh, one current wrestler that you'd want to draw real quick? Oh, man. Let's see. Let me think. Let me think. We're very quickly. A current wrestler that we could do. I think current. I'd love to do Brock Lesnar. I haven't oh, done Brock. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you could really have a lot of fun with that. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, how do you they follow you on Twitter and anything else you want to plug? Let's let's get it over. Uh, you you can you can follow me on Twitter. Last can draw at last can draw. You can see the double entendre there, right? I can yeah. draw pictures and I can draw a crowd. I now, love it. Somebody that said last will never draw a dime. I'm drawing dimes. I'm drawing pennies. I'm drawing quarters. I'm drawing people. I'm drawing caricatures. No. So uh, you can follow me on that. You can email me at lastwcwaol.com. Uh, predominantly what I do right now, as a matter of fact, as far as plugging things outside the Tom limit draw, I also do, uh, I do events where I do live caricature, right? So if you've ever gone to a theme park or you've ever gone to a carnival or a fair and you've seen the booth set up and the guy draws you in about six minutes, just an exaggerated portrait of you, I get booked out by about 12 or 14 different companies. I'm not exclusive to anybody. They just call, ask me if I'm available. And I take it like a wrestler would take wrestling books, you know, and I do, I've done bar mitzvahs. I've done wedding receptions. I do corporate Christmas parties. Uh, you know, I do a little bit of everything. I do fairs, do festivals. Um, tomorrow night I'll be uh, 
at a shopping center in Georgia, as a matter of fact, doing it for a spring, you know, festival. And I just do caricatures, man. They pay me a, 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 an hourly rate. I come in, I do caricatures for their event. Or if someone wants a commission, a caricature commission, I do these full, full color posters like we were talking about earlier. And I have a commission rate sheet, depending on what size you want, everything from four by six, black and white, all the way up to a 20 by 30 color. It just depends on what you're looking for. And uh, they, they can feel free to email me or direct message me on Twitter, and I'll send them those rates. And if they want a commission, man, we'll put them in line. We'll give them a commission. Let's get it cooking, man. I like it. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, and just the fact that you, you're Lash LaRue, and you also draw, it's just pretty damn cool. So. Well, I'll tell you something else I've done really quick, too. Uh, we'll, we'll plug this, I suppose. I've done a few things that I call lash ups. You've heard of a mash up. Well, this is a lash up. I've had some people that want a commission done and say they're a big uh, Goldberg fan. Mm -hmm. so I'll draw them in Goldberg's gimmick. So I'll draw a caricature of them in Goldberg's gimmick. Uh, an example is I did one for a guy here recently. He had three young boys and he wanted me to do a character of his three young boys. And I did them in a very uh, uh, iconic, fabulous free birds pose. And I called it the fabulous three birds. And they, instead of being from Bad Street, USA, they were from Dad Street, USA. So that's the poster, right? So we can do a lash up as opposed to a mashup if that's what you're looking for. Hey, I'm, I'm game for, to get it cooking for you. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, sweet Lash, I can't thank you enough for this time. It's it's awesome to kind of touch base with you, get to know you a little bit more. And uh, dude, it's so I think Conrad is so lucky to have you in the Ad Free Shows group, and uh, I think the fans are too. And it's it's going to be great to see. I hope we get to grow together with it. Uh, yeah, man, I agree one hundred percent. It's been great becoming fast friends with you, man, and I love being a part of the Ad Free family. This is just wonderful all the way around. And man, how good it feels to be a part of this family. Heck yeah, brother. Heck yeah. All right. This is Dominic D'Angelo, WrestleZone.com. You can follow WrestleZone at WrestleZone.com. You can follow me at Dominic D'Angelo. And go to WrestleZone.com for all your wrestling news needs. But go to ad-free shows as well, too. And let's hit time limit draw.